What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. In partnership with Friends of Latin America and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink's YouTube channel. July 19 marks the 40, 42nd anniversary of the day the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional took Managua, Nicaragua, and ousted the U.S.-backed Somoza dictatorship, which had been in power for two generations, spanning over 40 years. As has been the case since 1979, through the 1980s, and most recently April of 2018, U.S. attempts to remove President Ortega from power are once again in full view with the simultaneous introduction of the Renacer Act in both houses of the United States Congress. Renacer uh, is the anacronym for reinforcing Nicaragua's and adherence to conditions for Electoral Reform Act of 2021. That's a mouthful, I know, for all of you. But if you read one or both acts, they're pretty much uh, verbatim, copies of one another. It's not basically nothing short of regime change legislation via economic sanctions. I encourage you to read both bills. The bills include such language as the need for the Sandinista government to improve its response to hurricanes, and this referencing the two hurricanes that, that hit Nicaragua November of 2020, and it's just absolutely um, amazing that this is even in the bill, considering some of the lack of um, hurricane response in the United States. So both bills contain language such as that. So that gives you an idea of what we're going to talk about today. So today, I want us to celebrate this 42nd anniversary by focusing on the successes of the Sandinista government. And to help us do that, we are joined live from Managua by our very special guest, Ivan Acosta. He is the Minister of Finance and Public Credit who, by the way, was placed under targeted sanctions by the U.S. Treasury May of 2020. I first heard Minister Acosta speak a few weeks ago when he presented the National Plan Against Poverty and Promotion of Human Development. I have asked him to join us today to present one part of his discussion that I found particularly interesting and wanted to share with all of you. So welcome, Minister Acosta. It's such an honor to have you with us this afternoon. And um, I'm so pleased that you had time to talk with us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here on such a creative program.
thank you very much for showing that graph which sums up the hopes and the challenges for the Nicaraguan people, the economic agents, producers, and the governments. These are not only challenges for the government, but for the society and the country. Before delving into these 12 topics, we needed to remember what the country was like in 2006. And that is not really referred to in the public and political debates. There is a different narrative. The country which uh, President Ortega received on the 10th of January 2007 was a country of blackouts. Blackouts happened where there was electricity and 50% of the population had no electricity. The country was turning its back on the rural communities and on the Caribbean. The indigenous people and the people of African descent did not exist. There wasn't a logic of incorporating or serving the autonomous peoples by means of public policies. The campesinos had been left behind as well as the producers due to the privatization of the National Bank and practically its disappearance. There was no financing, there were no credits, there were no roads, there was no energy, there was no drinking water. And social indicators such as infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate were in terrible condition. The figures were similar to those we see today, unfortunately, in a few Latin American countries, which are generally the countries that resort to the World Bank's IDA programs, which are clearly identified. Therefore, those 16 and 17 years of neoliberalism meant privatization of public services. In terms of education, the country was condemned to having only four grades in primary school. The healthcare system was also privatized. It was a country with no social investment, a lack of public investment, and that translated in only 50% of electrical coverage and many blackouts because there was uh, no capacity to generate electricity. And out of the 2,000 kilometers of road, only 30% was in regular condition. The lack of water, drinking water and sanitation, there was a great deficit in telecommunications. And the country's poverty figures experienced a turning point and they were turning into the worst figures in Latin America from 2002 to 2005, it went from 45% to 48.3% when it comes to general poverty and extreme poverty was reaching 17.2%. So the country with definitely a small economy had no public policies that indicated a change in direction. In fact, poverty was worsening. And the neoliberal government was proud because they said that they would bring foreign investment, the $243 million in foreign investment were not enough. There were not enough jobs and public investment barely surpassed $270 million. There were no resources in public policy, not even to provide primary school children with a glass of milk. So the neoliberal 
model was a disaster and we put an end to that on the 10th of January. Fortunately, we didn't experience a pandemic in 2004, 2005 or 2006 because it would have been very difficult to deal with that situation considering how the public services had been destroyed. Secondly, it's important to talk about what the government of Nicaragua under the leadership of Commander Ortega has done to change the situation of the country. So in the first place, all social and public services have been deprivatized. It's important to create public services to ensure free education and health care for our people. In the second place, public and economic policies need to center on the poorest. The main priority has to be the fight against poverty and extreme poverty. Successful public policies are not only those which make the economy grow or the foreign reserves grow or, or which ensure macroeconomic stability, but also those which ensure that most of the population improves continuously on a daily basis. So they need to be meaningful and valuable for the people. Governments need to be meaningful for the citizens. And that is done by giving back through resources and policies to the largest majorities. For instance, during the government of Commander Ortega, we managed to double more than 100% of the kilometers of road that were built, but we also ensured that 85% of roads are in a good condition. And that makes us the country with the best roads in Central America. We need to remember that we are the smallest economy in Central America, but we have the best roads. From 2007, we also managed to build the most modern and developed healthcare system in Central America by bringing investments in technology, improving the hospital infrastructure by hiring physicians and healthcare staff to take care of people. We also made quick progress in providing water and sanitation. We went from 60% to 91% in urban sectors in terms of drinking water. And we went from 30% to 57, almost 60% in terms of sanitation. And those are issues which are relevant for people's lives. That is not only for the political and business minorities, but for the largest majority. But I think that the most important change in direction implemented by Commander Ortega was making public education free at the primary, secondary, and university levels, making sure that our education system was coherent. As of the 10th of January, 2007, making sure that 100,000 students went back to school by providing free education, apart from free health care. But for the country to grow and to experience an extraordinary decade in social and economic terms, it was necessary to invest not only in roads and energy, but in capitalizing the rural communities. We mobilized 275,000 productive vouchers for women in charge of families in the rural sector, the productive food voucher. So we capitalized the small rural production. We developed the zero usury program and 
granted more than 1,300,000 credits to women to bridge the gender equality gap. Therefore, the government had extraordinary figures as well in terms of maternal mortality rate. It decreased by 67%. We went from 95 women who died every 100,000 to 35. And let us not forget that maternal deaths represent a lack of public policies because having a child is not a disease. So that represents a deficit in public policies. And we achieved a 67% decrease in that. And those are great challenges. Therefore, the country became more equal. There was greater participation. We implemented public policies focusing on the recovery of our productive capabilities. We managed to increase agricultural and livestock production by 75% and agricultural production by 85%. We doubled the size of the economy going from 6.5 uh, billion to 13.7 billion in the span of 10 years. But what's most important is how this was translated into the largest majorities. And we managed to reduce general poverty from 48.3% to 24.9% and extreme poverty from 17.6% to 6.9%. And these are extraordinary figures. And this was achieved with a social stability, consensus and dialogue and political stability. It was a decade characterized by social, political and economic progress. We didn't want to center only on the economic aspects as it happens in some countries. We wanted to make sure that the economic progress reflects positively on people's well-being. So we came to the conclusion that 2018 was an expression of hate by some minorities given the progress the country was experiencing and that had a great impact, the failed coup d'etat attempt had uh, an impact that was equivalent to 52 hurricanes, similar to Hurricane Iota in terms of its impact and the damage it caused. And it had such a great impact that the failed coup d'etat attempt caused a more severe damage than the global pandemic in Nicaragua. And that is extraordinary when you take a look at the figures. 24 billion against 4 billion. So it's like six times more damaging. And I think that shows the reason and something that is worth condemning, which is destroying the country's capabilities for the poorest. So in that context, we developed this national plan against poverty and for human development, and we include these 12 guidelines, which are basically the hopes to bridge certain gaps. We've had some progress, but there are still some important gaps then reinforcing the government's efforts in the fight against poverty and also the hope of eradicating extreme poverty no government no society should have extreme poverty a population with less than 1.25 dollars per day so we summarized all that in this graph that you're seeing on the screen what are the relevant topics? Well, definitely the macroeconomic stability is something that we have to continue working on. 
We are a country that managed to develop a solid strategy in terms of public finances sustainability, improving its balance sheets, reinforcing its reserves, having a sustainable indebtedness strategy, which allows to lay the necessary groundwork to attract more private investment and in a strategic way, foreign direct investment that allows to create the jobs that the country needs and that it also has a positive effect on the income and the salary of the Nicaraguan people. We also thought about improving the basic conditions for development by providing people with electricity, by building roads and bridges, by accelerating the provision of water and sanitation to the population, by ensuring strategic investment for the ports in the Caribbean, by attracting investment for our railroads, and we are studying if it can be electrical with Korea, investing in a strategic riverside in the Pacific that allows us to develop a tourist hub in the Nicaraguan Pacific coast, ensuring that the rate competitiveness matrix is a reality to attract more investment and foster the agricultural and livestock industry to create the necessary jobs, to continue working on healthcare and education, to strengthen our gender equality strategy. And we are proud of the effort the country has made to be among the first five countries, according to the World Economic Forum, only surpassed by four Nordic countries. And in order to do that, we need to capitalize and invest in bridging the gender equality gap and strengthen women's role, not only to recognize uh, women, but also because the country needs it. If women represent 52% and they do not have equal participation, then it will be more difficult to develop the country. Women are leading figures, not only in the political sector, but also in production, in society. They have influence over the family. So if the country wants to develop more quickly, it needs to bridge its gender gap, also the rural and urban gap and the gap between the minorities and the majorities. We need to bridge all the gaps and create equality so that the country can develop quickly and do it in a balanced way for people to live better. Another strategic guideline that we have included is climate change that we have linked to our productive matrix. We believe that we need to administer the water resources to recover the water basin, that we need to reforest and to attract forestry investment, which are strategic for the life of the country. But we have to do this in an articulated way with the productivity matrix because the agents of this change are the more than 300,000 producers or rural producers. And we've noticed that the positive effects from climate change derive from the successes that we have when fighting against rural poverty and when transforming the agricultural and livestock sector. Because if the rural sector becomes wealthier, then that will be harmonious with nature because they can produce more in a better way by providing a better quality of life to the rural sector. And that translates into having better water, better forests, more diversification, and above all, more oxygen so that the economy, the rural economy can work. I think that's essential. And lastly, I would like to talk about a topic 
that I think is worth highlighting because I am from the Caribbean coast and I would like to highlight this, that we have designed a strategy to implement a special development area in the Caribbean coast, given that the Caribbean coast has always aspired to be the connection point to the Caribbean, uh, to the North American Caribbean and the South and Europe. But we are one of the few countries which have a Caribbean coast with no ports. So we are planning the construction of a port near Bluefield in that area that will allow for the development of the autonomous region which comprises 38,000 square kilometers, which is equivalent to 1.70% uh, of the size of El Salvador. So it's almost twice the size of El Salvador. And we have recognized 23 territories of indigenous peoples. And the government of Commander Ortega has given the Caribbean region the largest public investment stock in history. We're talking about electricity, road connections, airports, hospitals, in the furthest municipalities, ensuring energy for the rural sector, mainly solar energy, and also providing water and sanitation to all the municipalities. And I think this is a great act of historic justice uh, by the country towards the ethnic minorities that had been excluded for a long time until the 1979 Sandinista revolution. And it was a topic that gained popularity after the Autonomy Act was adopted in 1987. So with this investment, the Caribbean coast will experience a strategic transformation. The quality of life of ethnic minorities will increase, but this will also contribute to the development of the country. So this National Plan Against Poverty and for Human Development is a summary of the aspirations of the indigenous and the Nicaraguan people. So I think I've given you a quick summary of all of this and it's been a great opportunity to share this National Plan Against Poverty. Thank you so much, Minister Acosta, for, for this fabulous presentation. It's very, very inspiring. It's very ambitious. And it's also, um, in my personal experience, been very successful with the exception of um, the setbacks that um, your country incurred with the coup attempt in April of 2018, two horrific hurricanes, fall of 2020, uh, and on top of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, I was in um, Nicaragua, I spent all of March in, in your country, it was an honor to be there, wonderful people, I have to say it was, um, really felt quite at home among you and your countrymen. I wonder, I, well, before I ask you this question, I just would like the audience to know that um, the Nicaraguan people love their country. Um, they very much support this vision that uh, Minister Acosta has um, presented to you. And the thing that made the biggest uh, impression to me in March, and then of course hearing the President Minister Acosta's presentation last week, is that this plan, this human and economic development plan, benefits the large, large majority of the entire population. It is not simply uh, to the benefit of one um, demographic sector of the Nicaraguan populace. It is a vision to uh, develop and raise uh, the vast majority of the of the Nicaraguan citizens, and that and, and it's very it's very apparent when you spend you know time in the country. One of the things that uh, was mentioned in the presentation that maybe made a few of our um, a few members of our audience um, 
give some pause was the the idea of private investment and foreign direct investment and i wonder if you can explain uh to all of us how that um is being cultivated and managed um with uh the philosophy of sandismo that is you know prevalent in your in your culture today Yes, the country has taken a leap of quality in terms of the design, the management, the implementation and the use of financial resources from bilateral development financing and multilateral financing to the point in which Nicaragua is the most recognized country by multilateral banks in terms of its accountability its management and use of funds uh, we've had enormous results they are public they are on the documents by the world bank the idb the central american bank for economic integration the european investment bank we have uh, an incredible record of recognition and if a country manages well designs well, uses well, and is accountable, then the number of projects grows rapidly. And that has allowed us to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in energy to provide that 46%, which had never had electrical connection with electricity. It is probably the shortest time span, I mean, eight years, for the second half of a country to get electricity. And it's the second farthest half because it's a rural community. And we've also made progress in terms of roads, productive investment, drinking water. And that creates a gross capital stock that is good for the country that improves the country's competitiveness conditions and that's a necessary groundwork to make sure that we reduce transaction costs in the economy for the whole economy for the small producer and the big producer to have roads with electricity and drinking water that benefits everyone not just one sector everyone will benefit from the positive impact of reducing transaction costs Therefore, when it comes to attracting or bringing in resources for public investment, that starts with a good design and good management, but it is necessary to implement the program well and to be accountable to the resources from our partners, from banks, from multilateral cooperation. And that creates a virtuous cycle because one has a good performance and one receives resources and creates a positive impact. And this variable is very important for foreign direct investment because if a business person is in Australia or in New Zealand, he or she doesn't know the country. So the business person takes a look at the most important economic indicators and he probably considers the level of competitiveness of the country, whether the roads are in good condition or not whether the rates are competitive or not. And if the country and the government are committed to investing enough resources to make the country more competitive and allow for crowding of resources. So probably the business person takes a look at the IMF or central bank indicators and takes a look at the macroeconomic stability levels, fiscal discipline, the sustainability of economic and financial policies, he or she will surely take a look at the results in terms of legal safety and investment safety. Therefore, without having been to the country because he or she lives far away, the business person can continue to invest. And in this way, we've received important investments in mining and renewable energy, in energy in general, investments in the agricultural sector, it's one of the most successful 
free trade zones in Latin America, it has doubled the number of jobs in the last few years. So we think that public investment together with macroeconomic stability and economic indexes strategically contribute to creating trust and to giving it meaning. But there is another variable. In Central America, from the Northern Triangle to Mexico, that's probably the most violent area which is not at war. So when you find a country that is well established and which has a public safety strategy, a contention wall for its neighbors in the south and for the Northern Triangle, which creates a safe shelter for investment, a downward rate in terms of the number of homicides every 100,000 inhabitants. It is the safest country in Central America. We have the lowest amount of homicides every 100,000 inhabitants. There are no kidnappings. And even vehicle theft, which is famous in countries that are close by, that doesn't exist in Nicaragua. The last case was 10 or 11 years ago. So. For instance, migration, if one takes a look at the outflow index of people who leave Central America for the United States, it's very strange to find a Nicaraguan person. So that can only be the result of a set of public policies which are attractive to foreign investment. It's a safe country, a very nice country with a low cost, close to the beaches, close to volcanic lakes, with great economic stability and a public policy aimed at providing the country with social cohesion, investment in education, deluxe hospitals for the population. And maybe you have had the chance to visit the Fernando Vélez Páez Hospital, which is probably a better hospital than most private hospitals in Central America, there are extraordinary private hospitals throughout Central America, which generally are um, funded by uh, North American investments. But when it comes to a country with such a small economy, it should be recognized that we are developing and carrying out public policies aimed at a strategic goal, which is strategic for all countries reducing poverty and eradicating extreme poverty. So I think that having good public policies, economic stability, safety, and public investment is very attractive to foreign direct investment. I, I have to say one, yes, it was at, in, um, in the healthcare system while there in March, and it's one of the most efficient experiences I've had in my entire life. And the care is very high level of professionalism and effective. It was, uh, was a very positive experience. I, I also want to mention to the audience, well, one, when, uh, when the minister is talking about uh, the Northern Triangle, he's referring specifically to uh, Guatemala, Salvador, El Salvador, and Honduras, which um, I think many of you watching know um, how much migration comes from those three countries and that many of the root causes of migration are due to this neoliberal uh, economic model um, placed on those three countries um, by the United States. Also, I should share um, with the audience and with you, Minister Acosta, while in your country in March, which I will say was the sixth time I've been to Nicaragua since 1984, um, and I was there for the first time July 19th, 1984, the most common thing we heard, and we heard this throughout the country, we were in Managua, we were in Esteli, in Ortega, and Birui, was that people would say, we don't have a lot, but life is good here. And when they mention, when they say life is good here, they mean life is stable, it's economically stable, there's physical stability and security, and no reason to leave. People love their country. And when they say we don't have a lot, well, that refers to what the minister's been talking with us today about the development 
um, of the economy for the vast majority of the citizens. And people are really enthusiastic about this. They're very, very enthusiastic and they're happy to talk about it. And also, um, the road system, I would argue, is, is not simply the best in Central America. I think it's the best in the Americas, including the United States. <laughs> it's a fantastic infrastructure uh, project and the roads are incredibly uh, well-built and well-maintained. So I wonder, um, you know, before um, I let you go this, this afternoon, if we could talk a little bit about um, the government's decision to leave the economy open during the pandemic. It's thriving there. Um, and I can say that through personal experience. So the decision to leave the economy open and um, also, just for the audience to know, when the minister was speaking about foreign loan and having a good, you know, uh, a good reputation on paper and on field performance, Nicaragua has outperformed on most uh, measuring variables, has outperformed IMF loan requirements until until the United States government has uh, manipulated those statistics when introducing uh, the Renaissance Act in the Senate and the Congress. But it's really, really important for all of you to understand that um, this government and, and its financial uh, leaders have outperformed uh, the requirements of the IMF specifically, but other um, foreign investment firms as well. And, that, and that's really a credit to you, Mr. Acosta, and 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 the and the people um, helping you implement to secure uh, foreign investment and and implement your projects, and it's that foreign investment that uh, the Renaissance Act is going to attempt to block. And so you and so I just think it's so important for all of you watching today to really understand this project that Minister Acosta has talked to us about, how exciting it is, how positive it is, and how it benefits the vast, vast majority uh, of Nicaraguan citizens. And so, um, so before we go, please talk to us about the decision to keep the economy open. And also, I guess one other thing to comment on is, is, is food sovereignty. You mentioned the development and, the, and, the, and procuring secure economic security for the 300,000 rural food pr uh, producers. Nicaragua is 95% food sovereign. Um, which is an impressive um, statistic. So, so if you could comment on those two on those two variables um, before before I let you go, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Of course. So, firstly, the decision to keep the economy working back in April 2020 is the result of a multivariable analysis of a strategic decision-making matrix. In the first place, Nicaragua is a country which has a great rural community. Almost half of the population lives in small rural municipalities. Therefore, the risk of infection is low, practically non-existent because people live 100 meters away from each other. Families meet at parks. There is no overcrowding in many municipalities. The second factor is a social and economic one. There is a large popular or informal economy in which people live on a daily basis out of what they can do at popular markets in the agricultural sector, in the transportation sector. Therefore, closing the economy would paralyze their livelihoods to live on a daily basis. The third element had to do with the fact that if 99.9% .9 of countries decided to close, then we didn't have to because we wouldn't receive people from abroad. And the fourth element 
had to do with the fact that it was necessary to strengthen and reinforce the healthcare system. You can take all the necessary measures, social distancing, hand washing, wearing masks. But if your healthcare system is not strong, and that is something that is seen in many developing countries, there may be a collapse. And when we took a look at the figures, we saw that from 2007, the hospital investment stock had grown quickly. During my presentation, I said that it went from 3 billion Cordobas to almost 17 billion. Furthermore, the medical staff was increased by 140% and the healthcare staff by 60%. So there was an important public healthcare infrastructure throughout the country. 1,333 healthcare stations, people had access to healthcare at their doorstep. Great changes were made. The voluntary network was reinforced to perform these 5 million visits. There are a bit more than 1.2, 1.3 million houses, and we made 5 million visits. So we analyzed our risks to continue strengthening the healthcare system, to have the ICUs, the ventilators. But we also needed to make sure that the rest of the country, apart from not getting the virus, could get the resources they needed, could continue working. And in the first review conducted by the IMF, it was said that the economy was losing between 11 and 14%. And that is a disaster that happened in many countries. And we said, okay, so in those conditions, we need to strengthen the healthcare system. We need to visit people, accompany them, educate them. But we also need to protect the rest of the population. And by this, we mean that they need to be working actively. And apparently, we were right, because a few months later, all the countries started opening their economies bit by bit. So we managed to reduce that estimation, that forecast by the IMF of between 11 and 14 percent to minus 2 percent. So we prevented a great damage to the economy by carrying out a matrix analysis based on the reality. But there is something else. We think that being able to take care of the people quickly so that the healthcare system doesn't collapse, to continue providing services was key to not experiencing the situation that happened in South America where hospitals were collapsing due to overcrowding. So we were able to say we have the capabilities to provide public health care to people. We are ready. And we probably have the best family and community healthcare model. Surely the best one in Central America. Um, and there are Caribbean countries with great healthcare systems. But we have the best one in terms of its response because our healthcare system, it centers on the epidemiological subject that many countries have left behind. There may be good hospitals which are great at treating strokes or cancer, but they have left their epidemiological policies aside as if it were something from the previous century. So by having those capabilities, we discussed with the different officials from the financial and the healthcare sector, and we decided that we could reinforce the healthcare system while at the same time having the economic activity as a priority. And we've had extraordinary results. And we're probably the Latin American country with the lowest number of cases or with the lowest fatality rate. And we are quickly reactivating our economy. Last year, the economy experienced a minus 2% decrease, which was one of the lowest GDP falls. And we are now recovering by 5% more than what was forecast for 2021. 
And I think that the producers linked to agricultural exports should be given credit because we continued to export coffee, sugarcane, meat, seafood, beans to Central America. And the, all the economic agents continued working while at the same time taking care of themselves and allowing for the economy to continue working because if the economy doesn't work, we won't have resources to continue reinforcing the healthcare system. If I don't have resources, how can I import expensive medications that have gone up by 500%? We needed to have resources to get face masks. So having identified a way of maintaining these two topics as a priority has given great results. And secondly, you mentioned our production policies, reinforcing exports, uh, food safety, and how to make progress towards food sovereignty. In Latin America, even though many countries have an agricultural industry, Nicaragua is one of the countries in which most of what's on the table is produced nationally. Nicaragua is similar to Mexico in the sense that people eat rice, beans, meat, chicken at a high rate, bananas as well, and all of that is produced in the country here. And there are incentives to produce and to have consumption. 80% of the consumption is produced nationally. But what's important is to increase productivity so that we can fulfill the needs of the local market and also reach the markets in neighboring countries, as is the case of our beans, our milk, our cheese, because that creates wealth for the rural producers and for the country. We are the greatest meat producer in Central America, and I think that in the future, we will be one of the benchmarks due to the quality and the safety of our meat. And also because we are very close to the markets. So in terms of logistics, prices are better. The United States is a great consumer of Nicaraguan meat in the south of the country in Florida. Therefore, if we increase productivity, if we have the necessary technical assistance, if we manage to have financing for the productive matrix platform, that will ensure food sovereignty, but that will also allow us to reach more and better markets in Central America, in Mexico, in the United States, Canada. But that's why we talked about a Caribbean port because we are facing Europe and we don't sell much to Europe. We're also close to the Pacific and we don't sell much to Asia. And we also don't export much to South America. Therefore, we want to achieve greater productivity in the agricultural sector, greater competitiveness by means of ports, airports, so that our national production can enter more and better markets, and that will have a positive result, which is food safety and sovereignty. Well, it, what an exciting vision for your people and your country. It's, it's fantastic, and I'm so, um, I'm happy to say I was able to experience it earlier this year, and I'm so thankful, um, Minister Acosta, that you've been able to join us today and share this vision the success of this project um, with, with our audience. It's really been an honor um, to, to have you with us today. And I just really want to extend um, a happy July 19 um, to you and your countrymen and, um, an and a wish uh, for your continued success and um, also want to let our audience know that you can specifically um, 
assist in keeping the United States um, regime chain efforts out of Nicaragua and allow the Nicaraguans to maintain their sovereignty and continue to grow their country in their own vision uh, by helping stop the Renaissance Act in both the Senate and in Congress. I would encourage you uh, to contact codepink.org for that and also the Nicaragua network at afgj.org um, to learn more about that. And also everyone, please be sure to catch Code Pink's What the F is Going On in Latin America every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Um, Eastern on Code Pink YouTube. And again, Minister Acosta, an honor to have your time this afternoon, a pleasure um, to be in conversation with you and I hope we can do it again. Thank you very much. It really does have a suggestive name. It sounds better in English. What the if is going on in Latin America? It's excellent. <laughs> That's probably true. So, okay, everyone, thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next week. <laughs>